Hey everyone, a top 10 list. Sorry it's been so long since I've done one. Unfortunately, you know, Essen kind of gets a bit busy for me around October, so therefore it's hard for me to put out top 10s and other types of videos when I got so many games to review. I mean, I've still got stuff here that's in shrink wrap or needs like reviewing. It's hard to get through them all, especially when it's just by myself. But I wanted to get this top 10 done for a while, and you'll be watching this either on YouTube, on my channel, or during the Dice Tower Marathon. The Dice Tower are doing another one of their great marathons, they're always a good laugh, and they said they wanted a bunch of videos to kind of pass the time so they didn't have to take breaks, so I've submitted a couple of top 10s. One of them is this one, which some of you may have already seen on my channel. However, the other top 10 that you won't have seen on my channel will be my top 10 retrospective list of 2018. So the list where I look back on 2018 and think, okay, now that I've played more games from 2018, has my list changed? Have some games dropped or risen over time? And that one will be released on my channel, but you'll get like a first premiere during the Dice Tower Marathon. So call that as a little gift to you guys, okay? But anyway, on with the show. This is my top 10 hidden gems, and with hidden gems, the definition of this is kind of hard to describe in a sense, but I like to think of them as kind of underrated games, reasonably small maybe, they're not necessarily big games, although a couple of them are big, you know, normal box sizes, but they're ones where I had no idea what they were. Probably didn't even expect them, didn't even hear of them, just sort of waltzed by at Essen or at the Expo and just went, hmm, that looks pretty good, what's this? And as to playing it going, this is really good. Or this is a solid game. I wish I knew about this before. And then it's either in my collection or I've recommended it to cafes, that kind of thing. It's just one of those things where I can say that it sort of hid away underneath all that kind of hype and buzz that you get with a lot of games that are released and just sort of said, what about me? And then I pick it up. It's like a little lost puppy or something. It's just like you find it and you go, aww. And then you play it and you go, this is really good. I'm going to keep it. So that's my top 10 hidden gems. Without further ado, let's get going. So armed with my little black book of top 10 lists, we're going to get going with number 10, which is a small game that I found from Blackrock Games. Um, it's Blam who does it. But Blackrock Games were the first people to show it to me. I'd never heard of it at all. Just never heard of it. Just thought, okay, this looks pretty pretty. I liked Celestia, which was the original game that I liked for them. That one I didn't consider to be a hidden gem per se, because it had a little bit of buzz for being a reprint of Cloud9. This one was just out of the blue. I played it two player and thought, this is actually pretty solid. And that is Chakra, right behind me here. This little game is actually better than it looks. Well, actually, no, that's a lie. It's as good as it looks. It's a very beautiful game. But Chakra is this nice little puzzle where you're trying to align your Chakra gems. You've got lots of different uh, cubicles for the gems in a big column, and you need to get three of the same color in each, and they're all specific. You use these tokens with specific actions to move the gems up and down the tree, and well, up and down the column, I guess, in such a way that they will eventually line up. But of course, they block each other, there's only so much space, and every round you have to pick three more gems from a selection, effectively drafting, and they may not necessarily be all the colors you want, you've got to dump them at the top, maybe use an ability to put them somewhere else, and it's basically, kind of think of like Otis, where you were juggling around where the divers went, and where the cubes were, so you could cash them in. It's a bit like that, except you're getting colored gems into particular spots and when you fill up a spot it no longer counts as a space and you have to refresh every now and again this hidden scoring it's a nice little game and it's well produced you know you've got those same sort of color plastic gems that you see in a lot of games but i thought this was pretty neat as a two player i think it shines three and four player is fine just get rid of the ap players i would say because you want this to last about 30 minutes to 45 minutes and it kind of does but i had no idea this existed i just came across it and thought this was really nice. I want to do a review on it. You can check out my video on that for more details. But yeah, Chakra is a nice little puzzle game that you should give a look if that's your thing. My number nine is a bigger box game, but most people have not played this. They may have heard of it, but they have certainly not played it. And I looked at it thinking, oh, this artwork's not perfect, but I mean, I'll give it a go. It's about cars. I might like it. And these days, I don't think you can get it anymore. I think it's out of print, but, you know, maybe one day it will come back in the print. We never know. But this was a solid game about making cars. And unlike some other cars, like maybe Kanban or Kraftwagen and a few others, you actually make cars from the get-go. Just get on with it. Just hurry up. Here's some parts. Go make a car. And now go make another car. Now sell this car. Go to Europe. Go to America. Do you want safety? Do you want, uh, you know, speed? Do you want like, accessories and spoilers and stuff? It's very much a 
reasonably lightweight game about making cars. And if I can get some of this Essen stuff out of the way, I can actually get it off the shelf. That is Automania. Automania is underrated. I think this was a solid kind of sort of worker placement. It had a nice twist where you placed it on this grid and you picked up the marker, but it costs a certain amount of meeples to do it more often or to bump someone off. And the idea was, was that if you sort of got rid of other people's meeples, then, you know, they went back to the player. So you were effectively giving them more turns. It was quite a nice little twist, but it's, you know, okay, not the most attractive thing in the world. I'll give it that. It could use a second edition. Well, this is the second edition, I think. Um, it could certainly use a third edition reprint, I think, maybe from a different publisher or even just the same publisher, but just more blinged out. Uh, but I really like it. It's just, you know, nice and simple. It's thematic, it works, you know, you're constantly having to sort of look ahead and forward plan as to, let's see, uh, currently everybody's like thinking more about the economy, but uh, later on I'm going to be more obsessed with speed, so maybe I should get some speed upgrades now and then put them on my uh, car for later, or you might just go for short-term goals. Are you going to go to America who want, uh, you know, more like victory points, or is it more money, I can't remember which way around it is, or Europe which has the opposite, so one is more victory points, one is more money. It can lead to some time scores the mechanics are not difficult the game is not that long you know we're talking 75 to 90 minutes max I'd say for a four player game it's a solid title and I wish it was in print but if you find this on a bring and buy sale because it does turn up on there every now and again I highly recommend you grab it if it's going for a good price and check it out for yourself my number eight, I'm not going to get out of the box over there, it's too far away and it's in a deluxe set, but uh, this is more of a hidden gem because of when it came out as a small box, and I think you can still get it as a small box, but this is a really quirky, abstracted card game, which kind of plays similar to a lot of other games by the same publisher like Mott and I and Glory to Rome and that, but it's one of those games where you, you're playing cards in a tactical fashion and you keen off all these different abilities and you know, you've know you got co-op abilities and competitive abilities and it's mainly just collect a bunch of symbols and splay cards everywhere. But I didn't know it really, didn't know a lot about it. All I heard was Tom Vassell mentioning it a few times and everybody else hating him on it for it. It was like, okay, this is odd, but I mean, I'll give it a try and see what it's like. Innovation has become one of my favorite card games. I wish I could play it more often, unfortunately, because uh, it's um, one that you kind of only want to play two player, three if people know what they're doing, four, bleh, no. But it's not an easy game for people to get into. You kind of have to find people who are used to this sort of tactical card game thing. You know, I've got a friend of mine who we regular play uh, Mott and I together, and we're trying to equal on that. He's probably the perfect player for me to show him innovation, but I think this is a cool little game. You know, I didn't expect much of it, and it wowed me with the whole tactical play. Yes, you know, there are some random elements, but it's more about when you get the cards, what are you gonna do with them? What cool combos can you create? And it's great when you draw a couple of cards and go, Ooh, that could work. You know, if I do that with that, that might work. All right, let's do that for a bit. Then your opponent starts getting a lot of the uh, the, the crown symbols, and he's like completely busting you with his castle. It's like, hmm, I kind of need to defend against that. Well, hang on, I could uh, reroute that over there. Like, you 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 got to think on the fly, and whether you're going to go for one of those victory cards at the like the eighth, ninth, or tenth age, or go for dominations, or just go for straight up points and run the game out, it's entirely up to you. So three different paths to victory. Sometimes a victory can just turn up without without you least expecting it. It's a cool little card game and definitely was a hidden gem for me, but it's not for everybody, I admit. And I do wish I could play it more often. I mean, if I knew someone who was just going to come around and play Innovation all day with me, I'd be set. But yeah, give this a go. Don't listen to Sam and Z. You know, they don't know what they're talking about on this one. This is a solid little card game. My number seven, people look at me with like weird faces. I was always like, really? We're going to play this game? Is this more for kids, Luke? Are you sure you're not, you know, like gone, coming down with a fever or something? No, this is a solid gateway level game. I mean, I'd say gateway level. Yeah, I mean, I've added an expansion in, but I think the base set is perfectly suitable for cafes and gateway level. It's a fun theme. It looks very nice. But yeah, when you tell people, hey, guys, you want to play Dream Home? Right. Yeah, you get a few weird looks. But Dream Home was completely unheard of for me. I mean, I did not know nothing. I know nothing about this one. I, I can't even remember how I came across it. I think I was just like shopping around and maybe I heard it on one video somewhere. I literally cannot remember where I found out about this game. But it pretty much must have surprised me like to no end because normally I would think, oh yeah, I know where I heard about this. I 
So you guys here was constantly going on about it, or, uh, oh yeah, I saw loads of people playing Spyfall, or this war of mine, and it's got the controversial theme, so I knew about that one. This one, though, just somehow turned up in my collection, and now I don't want to get rid of it. It's a salad gateway game. You're building a house with different rooms, playrooms, lounge, kitchen, like that. You've got two floors and a garage area. You can only build floors, like, from the ground up, obviously, you know, the theme and that. But you're using these different cards with special abilities to get, to, like, to shuffle roof cards or room cards around. You've got the different, uh, like, rooms themselves. They score if you can make them bigger. You're drafting them from this uh, board with columns on it, so you draft a column, and the next player does, so turn order is important. You know, sometimes you really want to extend your lounge, but you got to think, oh, I'm being lumbered with a kitchen. Do I really want a kitchen there? And there's different ways to score points. Granted, it's a lot better for me because I have the expansion, the Sunny Side expansion, I think it's called, or Sunny Street, 156 Sunny Street. That one is a very simple expansion to include. It just adds two more ways to score points, a few extra cards, and capability for six players, which works. This one does up to four. This is actually a pretty sweet six-player game. I can't put it on the six-player list, though, because unfortunately it required an expansion to do it. But this is one of those games where it adds more players, and I'm like, yeah, cool. You're basically just drafting around, and you've got all the different cards, and just to see five or six different houses built where everybody's gone mad or is bantering with each other about like, oh yeah, yours is yours is just a gamer's house, isn't it? Or like yours is, is a, are, you, are you building a house or a swimming pool? It's just nothing but bathrooms and hot tubs. It's a great, very nice looking, well-produced game. Very easy to play, very easy to teach. And as I say, hidden so much that I can't even remember how I found it. You know, this is definitely one to check out if you need something for families or new gamers alike. With my number six, now, Splendor is still a really good favorite game of mine. You know, it's still a top 100 game. I've taught it to my parents, I've taught it to so many people, I've lost count, and loads of games come out and try to be the next Splendor, and it just, they don't measure up to me. It's like, okay, you're simple and you're fine, but you, you take longer than Splendor, or you're not as easy to teach as Splendor. Splendor just works for me. So this one was one that I thought might replace Splendor at one point, because it's from the same designer, so I thought, oh, it's gonna be similar line, but, you know, pretty much no one's ever heard of this one. It came out, I think, just after Christmas in the UK, which is like, okay, no one's even looking at games at that point. And, you know, I just decided, you know what, it's got a boring looking theme. It's certainly not got the best title in the world, but I'll give it a try. It's from that designer. This one, whoop, come on, love letter, stay in there. Majesty for the Realm. Yeah, you, you look at that cover, it's pretty. You look at the title and you think, Okay, boring. What? <laughs> it's like a Majesty for the Realm? It sounds so generic. And yeah, it is kind of generic. But this one is a fun little game. You, you're building, you've got all these location cards in front of you, and there's A and B sides for good variety, and they score in different ways. And what you're doing is that, kind of like in Century Spice Road and Small World and that game, where you have like a row of cards to pick from, and if you want to pick further along the row, you've got to place something down and you run out of it quick and you've got to try and get it back, that sort of thing. It's that kind of mechanic, which is good, it works, and I like it. But with this one, you're getting characters, you know, knights and witches and uh, innkeepers and things like that, and you place them in your village under where they normally score, and they score, and they cumulatively get better. Like, you know, one character might get you three points, and then the second one gets you six, and then the third one gets you nine. And they may trigger effects like fighting other people's villages and killing off their characters or resurrecting your own. You know, there's some very cool ways that you can create nice combos with this, but it's very nice, very simple. It plays four players in under 45 minutes every single time. It's never gone longer than 45 minutes. So it was on that cusp of beating out Splendor. And it says 20 to 30 minutes on the box. You could do a two player game of this in 20 to 30 minutes. I don't deny that. It's a sadded little card game, but more than likely most people have not even heard of it. And certainly, I barely knew anything about it when I came across it. It's just like, oh, it's the same guy who did Splendor. Okay, looks a bit of a generic thing, but let's give it a go. And now it's in my collection and it's there to stay. It's not better than Splendor, in my opinion. I still think Splendor kind of pips this, but I, I think this is one that you should probably check out. If there's any negatives I have to say, apart from the fact that it's like a generic theme, uh, the coins in this are a bit annoying. I mean, they're good quality, but you have to constantly change up money-wise. So you need to get more denominations in this game. But yeah, solid little standalone card game, Majesty for the Realm. My number five has been sitting on the table right next to me because I had to fetch it from the other room since I started this video. But uh, I was going to put Hanamakoji on this list. 
But then I had to rethink and I thought, look, I love Hannah Mikoji. It is definitely a gem for me. But then I kind of knew what I was getting into because Sam Healy was putting this on a lot of his top tens and I did a little bit of research and I thought, this sounds good. I really want to play it. So I was already kind of excited and knowledgeable about the game before I went into it. This one I wasn't. This was just a random new release from the same publisher, Emperor S4. But I thought this one was a better, like, just a better candidate for a hidden gem because I knew very little about it and I was surprised how much I like it and how much it's gone down so well with friends alike. And that is Walking in Burano. I've got the, I'm not sure if it's gone up yet. Um, probably hasn't, well, by the time you watch this video, it kind of depends, but uh, there's also a review that I'm doing or have done for Walking in Province. They're very different games, okay? It's just the way they've named them. But Walking in Burano is a really cool little card game. It's a lot packed into this small box, and Empress 4 just have a thing about knocking it out of the park with these small card games. But in Walking in Burano, you are trying to build a street of coloured houses, much like Burano, which I believe is a district near Venice. And... All these buildings are kind of like the same color, but they're multicolored. So you can kind of see like, you know, the red and the green and the yellow. It's all very picturesque. Well, what you're doing is that you're building these houses from a row of cards. You know, three rows of cards, roof, middle and bottom. But you have to take your cards each round from a particular column. So you may end up with cards that you don't want. But you're trying to build these buildings like in uniform colors. You're trying not to have duplicates next to each other. And when you complete a house, you take an, uh, what's they call them? Um, a resident, I believe, it's a, or an inhabitant card, and they score you points based on either the street or the house directly above it. And what you're trying to do is collect a lot of the symbols. So the houses have got all sorts of things like different color plants, uh, people, shop windows, cats, chimneys, all sorts of uh, curtains, drapes, that sort of thing. And with those, you score points, so you will pick up a different inhabitant every game for a particular house. You're only going to get five of them, and there's quite a lot to choose from, but it depends what symbols you've gone for, what you've managed to find. Uh, money is quite tight, you've got to manage it, but then you're also racing against everybody else, because whoever finishes their street kills the game, so you know it's better to finish your house, even if it means you have to kind of lose a few points because you couldn't make it the same colour. But it's got some tense decisions. There's, uh, there's certainly a lot of tension with players like, don't you nick my cards? Don't you nick my oh, I needed that green roof. You know, there's a lot of that. But quite simple to teach. There's a solo mode in this. It's just for the package it's in. It's a really solid game. I think I gave this a nine when I rated it. And I've played this with friends, you know, they knew nothing about it when they're going in. And they've liked it so much that I think two of them, like two couples, I think have actually gone and bought their own copy. That's how much they enjoyed this. It definitely takes the place of a solid hidden gem for me. Hit, walk, sorry, hidden in Burano, I was about to say. Now, walking in Burano. Honestly, if you haven't checked out a lot of Emperor S4 stuff, you really owe it to yourselves too. Especially if you're a fan of small card games with a lot of bang for their buck. My number four. Now, one thing to stress about this list I didn't make clear at the start, I'm not going in order of games I've rated highest. Because then probably I would say one coming up in a minute would be my favourite game on this list. And then maybe like Walking in Brano should have been second. This is not about how high I've rated them. It's balancing how I've rated them with how much knowledge I had going in or just how much the surprise factor of it being a hidden gem really got to me. This one was definitely a hidden gem, you know, and it's a reasonable square box, but I didn't really know the publisher. It was a Taiwanese company and they were at the UK Games Expo and they were very nice, very courteous, and they offered me a couple of games to review and this was one of them. And I looked at it and I thought, okay, this is interesting. It looks a bit like Carcassonne. It's very pretty though. It's got lots of uh, water areas and p uh, archipelago style artwork and I really like that. Oh yeah, see, you're getting symbols and putting little houses. Okay, this will be a little charming game. It's better than a charming game. It's actually fighting Carcassonne for dominance on my shelf. That's how good this game is. And if you haven't guessed, it's the one right behind me, which, oh, had the career of writing, so yeah, that's not going to help. Uh, but Small Islands. I think I've done a review. Yes, I have done a review of this one. And I know people have asked about me doing a solo play of this. Essen, I'm just really busy. I will try to get round to doing some solo plays in the future though, more often. Although, maybe they'll be seasonal because the problem is the run up to Christmas is very busy. But maybe like January, February, March, when game releases aren't particularly common, I'll do some more solo playthroughs because then I'll have a bit more time to do alternative videos. And I'll certainly put this high on the list. 
but Small Islands is definitely like a carcass, not a carcass and clone, but it's got a similarity for that towel lane mechanic. You're building a map of this archipelago area, lots of little islands and sea, and you're doing it with tiles. But the difference between this and Carcassonne is that you're not putting meeples on the board, you're putting houses. But the houses are based on these little objective cards which you'll chop and change every round on the tactical level. And with these like symbols you're trying to collect, you're trying to like say, right, this island needs to have two lotus petals and one temple. And then if I do so, I score points for every temple that's on the map. So you're trying to build islands in such a way that they will score you highly but you don't want to give away too much about what you want on an island in case anyone hoses you. And of course, the tiles that you collect, you only have so many available. I think you only have like three at a time uh, to choose from. And so you've got to think, oh, which tile is going to benefit me more? And, uh, you know, and then each round, which objective do you want? You know, you, you get a choice of the objectives and it's like, well, that island's not complete, but it's got a lot of those uh, green flowers on there. This one that scores for green flowers would be pretty sweet. Maybe I should try that. It's very simple mechanics. But it gives you that Carcassonne feel of building a really nice, pretty map. I mean, this is like so colorful and beautiful. It's unreal. Like all the blues and greens, basically all my favorite colors just rolled into this game. Uh, the production quality is pretty good. It's not a difficult game to teach. It has an interesting solo mode in this, you know, different from a typical solo mode. And there's even a cool mechanic where once in the game, you're allowed to trigger the end of the round. But when are you going to trigger the end of the round? Are you going to do it now? Are you going to wait a bit? You know, and there's that cool decision of you don't quite know when someone's going to end it. There's just a lot of neat little mechanics in this, but I had no idea what this game was. I didn't even know the publisher, Miso Games, uh, showed me this one. Although Mushroom Games, I think, was the main publisher of this one. I think Miso Games were just distributing it in, uh, like, you know, in, in Asia. But yeah, honestly, this is a really solid game. One to four players, 30 minutes if you're by yourself, but maybe like 45 minutes to an hour tops. It's just a really nice, beautiful game that I just really didn't know a lot about. And uh, what was it Alexis Allard? Yes, uh, I believe that's the designer. You know, he's done some cool stuff as well. So honestly, uh, whether you can find this easily or not is entirely... Uh, subjective. I don't know how much this is on retail at the moment, but uh, hopefully like a, an expo, like UK Games Expo next year, the publisher will be there again and you can try and buy it or maybe you've got it in your area. But definitely have a look for this one. This is, if you're very much like a, a Carcassonne lover, give this one a try and see whether it's like fighting for position on your shelf with you as well as me. So with another game that was definitely unexpected, but this is one of my Probably my favorite game on this entire list, actually. I would dare say, uh, yeah, that's pretty easy to say. Yeah, this is definitely my favorite game on the list, but it still is pipped slightly for the hidden gem definition by a couple others. But this one, no idea what it was. Never heard of it. Literally, I think this was like my first Essen, like four years ago I came across this, and I barely knew the publisher. I mean, I barely knew anyone at that point, because I was just starting out as the Broken Meeple, and I was building up slowly to what I'm doing now. But I came across this, and it just looked really colorful on the table. It's like, hmm, that's interesting. It looks abstracted, but it's lots of, lots of nice colors. What is this? And as I was being described it, the best way I could find to get it in my head was the Game of Life Euro Edition. Okay, so I sat down and played it with three complete strangers and thought, okay, so this is meant to be sort of like thematic, you know, deal, you know, tell it how you like, play it how you like, great, I love games where I get to choose my own path. And I just got immersed in the theme from the get-go. I mean, I was playing a nerd and I was, you know, writing books and designing computer games and I found myself a girlfriend who was also a bit of a geek and going on holidays and I eventually got myself a job and yeah, it's the pursuit of happiness. This game I knew nothing about, just literally came across it when I first sort of met up with Artipia Games and ever since then it has been a 10 out of 10 game for me. Love this so much. The expansion community added to it as well. I've got a bunch of mini expansions and the Kickstarter in it. I've just put in the newest expansion to this, um, Experiences. So I can now go on Experiences or Dream. I can forward plan cards. So I could say, you know what? I want a girlfriend, I want a family when I grow up. So I'm gonna plan that I'm gonna marry somebody called Daisy in the future. And then as you build, as you go through the game, it's worth more victory points if you let it build up. But if you don't fulfill your dream, you lose points instead. It's a neat, really thematic concept. And 
For a game that's just basically get a card and level up a cube on it and, you know, exchange resources like little light bulbs and that, the theme just comes out so well. And friends of mine, we're falling out of our chair laughing, we're bantering over the different lives that we've had. I've just put in a mini expansion called Fug's Life, where the activities and the jobs and that are all like nefarious. They're all like, you know, go rob a bank or be a mafia boss. The, the combinations are going to be ridiculous now with the stuff that can happen. It's only just fitting in the box, which is a shame, because anything with Stronghold Games uh, logo on it means it's, or even Artipio Games logo on it, kind of means the box size isn't going to be good enough for it. Any more expansions, and this will not fit, period. But, oh my god, I love this game so much, it is never leaving my collection. I adore it. Anytime somebody says we want to play Pursuit of Happiness, I'm like, oh, please tell me I'm free, please tell me I'm free, because I love to play it. And, you know, apart from the fact that, you know, I had a rough idea of, you know, as it was being explained to me, it's like, yeah, I'm going to like this when I jumped in. You know, and I was starting to get to know a little bit more about Artipio Games' style before then. But apart from that, this was basically a hidden gem for me. But there's two more that just ever so slightly pip it. I mean, it was really hard to pick my top three for this list. So... You know, what games could I have heard about even less before I played them and had more of a surprising impact? My number two has just come out in a swanky new edition. Yes, finally, people can get off my back about the fact that nobody can get hold of this game. I've been rabbiting on about it a lot. It is a brilliant solo game, one of my favorite solo games that's out there. And finally, Stronghold Games have brought it back into the limelight. However, I'm still going to hang on to my Asian version of Coffee Roaster. Yeah, I mean, talk about a theme where I was like, really, Coffee Roaster? This is going to be like a solid hit? I just heard about it briefly on the top 10 from Eric Summer, where he was talking about like something he'd played at Essen and said we should go see. And it's like, Coffee Roaster? Okay, fine, I'll go check it out. Walked to the Korean booth at Essen. I think this was my first or second Essen, I can't remember. And I sat down with them. I played, uh, the lovely young lady showed me the game. Uh, I, who was it that did it? Uh, was it? I think it was just called Career Board Games. Um, I think it was their stand. Lovely long, young girl showed me the game and just walked me through it. I played it and instantly fell in love with it to the point where I was sad that they didn't have it in stock at the time and I had to come back the next day to get a copy. Yeah. This made me sad that I couldn't buy it there and then. This is such a good solo game. There's an app for it now with the new edition. It's all right, it's good, but the UI is a bit fiddly and there's no sound and it's, I don't know, it needs a little bit of fine tuning, but then it's a solid implementation. But you know, if you can get the Stronghold version of this or even this version, doesn't matter. It's, it's Mechanically, it's the same game. It's just a different paint job. So I've got no need to get the next version of Coffee Roaster unless, they get it to me as a review copy, in which case I will review it and then I will, you know, because I don't think I've ever done a review on this, I've just talked about it a lot. But yeah, if they give me a review copy, I'll do a video on it and you can find out my more detailed thoughts on the matter. But with this one, it's just such a simple solo game where you're bag buildings, so you're drawing tokens out of a bag and you're trying to get your bag in such a way that when you're done doing shenanigans like mix, like leveling up beans and taking out beans, getting rid of smoke, you know, like drawing more tokens, filtering out the water, that sort of thing. You eventually have to then take 10 tokens out of the bag and put them in a cup. Well, a, on the board, it's shaped like a cup. And you're pouring your coffee, basically. So you roast it for as long as you like, do all your shenanigans, then pour it out, and hopefully you'll make a cup of coffee that fits the criteria of whichever one you're doing, whether it's on easy, medium, or hard difficulty. It's just highly addictive. I even showed this to a friend when we were waiting for Dice Portsmouth to take a break on a particular games day. We went to a Costa Coffee and I got this out and I showed it. It just worked brilliantly. Love this game. If you have not tried it, I highly recommend you now do, now that you can easily get hold of the wretched thing. It could be cheaper, I admit. I looked at the price tag. But honestly, if you like solo gaming, Coffee Roaster is one you must check out. And finally, my top pick for a hidden gem is one that never heard of, knew nothing about. It was a small box, less than a tenner, like nine quid I think I bought this for. I didn't expect anything of it because it's from a genre that I think is bloated as all get out right now. And most of the games in this genre are just highly repetitive and entirely multiplayer solitaire. 
But this one, I just got showed. I think I was at uh, Grey Fox Games' booth at the Expo. I think this was last year, maybe, a year before, I can't remember. And I just played it and thought, this works. This works. It's a game in this genre that I can get behind. It has some direct interaction. It's dice drafting. I want it. Here's my tenor. Take up my money. And so far, it's worked great with everyone I've shown it to, whether they are normally fans of the genre or not. It just goes down so well in a small package. And I'm going to have to reach over and grab it. Harvest dice. Yes. Every time I talk about the roll and write genre being too bloated, and every time I get a new one like, oh, it's fine, but again, it's multiplayer solitaire, you always hear me go on about Harvest Dice to the point of ad nauseum. But this is a, this is easily my favorite roll and write game. Hands down, no, work, no question. Because dice drafting, great fun. Looks good, easy to teach. Easy in hard mode if you want it, although I've never played it on easy mode, you would play it on hard mode every time, unless maybe you're doing it with kids. But it's very pretty, very cutesy, you're building up a vegetable patch and your vegetables, your free vegetables cannot be separated from each other so you have to build them in sort of orthogonally adjacent lines. But you're drafting dice from the middle in the three colours to say where you can put, draw your veg. And if you can't draw your veg anywhere or you choose not to, you can feed a little pig called Pip who basically eats the pips on the dice and gives you a little special abilities to change number or colours of the dice. The die you leave after the drafting phase is done levels up the, like, the victory points for each of that veg on your garden. I love that in games. Pioneer, Pioneer Days did it. Uh, and I think Old West Empress I might have done it as well where on uh, seasons and seasons did it as well um, when you draft dice but the one that's left has a profound impact on the game I love that mechanic it's one of my favorites because it just adds an extra choice to those last two dice for the last player it's not just as crystal cut as you might think but what this one does on top of that is that it solves the multiplayer solitaire issue. You can easily see when you look at other people's patches where they need cabbages and tomatoes and things like that. And as a result, it means that, okay, it's not like in your face direct interaction where like I play a card and I actively hurt you. But like in Azul where you can stitch people up with the tiles, you can actively stitch people up with the dice drafting in this. So finally, I care about the other players. Friends of mine have played things like Welcome To and Railroad Inc in sessions at conventions where there would 60 other people. What's the point? The games are multiplayer solitaire. You care nothing about the other 59 people. So why do it? It makes no sense. I don't get it. At least with this one, I have an active interest in all opponents at the table, even the one to my right, because I have to think, well, if I leave that die, they're probably going to take it. Will someone take it first? I don't know. And then obviously you've got that last die as well. So this is a solid little roll on right game. Easily my favorite in the bunch. There is no question about it. But such, I mean, it's a hidden gem in every respect of the word. Didn't know anything about it. 100% surprised about how much I enjoyed it. 100% flabbergasted on how it's basically the top of a genre that I thought was getting a little bit, well, uh, stupidly amount bloated at this point. It's small enough to be a hidden gem. It's a tiny little box. You probably wouldn't even glance at it twice on a shelf. You know, it's cutesy. It's just a small little box, small content, cheap as chips. I mean, I bought it for less than a tenner at a convention when they normally inflate prices. So yeah, this is just really nice. A brilliant, 30 minute filler for two to four players with two modes of play. It's just, it's great. It's a solid one. This easily had to make, now that I think about it, yeah, this had to be my number one hidden gem in every sense of the word. So, whew, top 10 hidden gems. And I see the lights are starting to go, so I'm gonna wrap this up. But yeah, I hope you enjoy this top 10. You know, I hope this uh, has given you some ideas for some other games that you may not necessarily have heard of. You could almost call this a kind of top 10 underrated games, but I think some of these games are rated pretty highly. They're just, for me, ones that I just didn't really expect much going in or never even heard of them and was just surprised. Like, oh yeah, this is a game for me. And all of these games are in my collection. So, you know, they're hidden gems for a reason because I'm keeping the gems in my collection. So that's it for me. I hope you've been enjoying the Dice Tower Marathon so far and, and these top 10 videos. And of course, all the other videos that the contributors are doing at this moment. You know, if you're watching this on YouTube after or before the fact, then well, I hope you enjoyed this video and check out some of my other content and don't forget to subscribe. So until then, I'll see you on the next Broken Meeple video. And regardless of whether these games are more hidden gems or diamonds in the rough for you, it's still only a game. Take care and happy gaming.